It's trying to spin, David. It's trying to spin. Oh, my gosh. You need to head to your safe place. This tornado is on the ground. I probably got to get out of here because this tornado is moving east, southeast, toward my location. Guys, that's it. Right there. Look at that monster. This is a huge tornado. You probably didn't forecast this, but we're doing the weather. I'm in no way a certified meteorologist, but I'm totally authorized to take you close to the storm. A tornado, that is. There's a reason we're so obsessed with tornadoes in the U.S. It's the only place in the world with the perfect ingredients for these storms. 75% of the world's tornadoes happen in the U.S. The other 25% mostly occur in Canada, the U.K., and Bangladesh. Most of the world's tornadoes occur in this area called Tornado Alley, where there's a recipe for a literal disaster. We've got a warm, moist air mass moving in from the Gulf of Mexico and a cool, dry air mass from the Rocky Mountains. These two overlap in the alley. The warm air beneath the cool air eventually rises and the two air masses interact. The moisture from the warm air creates supercells, the mothership of tornadoes. But while we know how tornadoes form, there's still a lot we need to learn. Tornadoes are like the black hole of weather. We can barely forecast them. Right now, science still only gives us an average lead time of 12 minutes to run or hide before a tornado strikes. And this means lives lost. The Nashville tornado in March this year came without warning for some, with only a six minute lead time and killed 25 people. But this isn't the case for other storms. We usually know hurricanes are bearing down days or even weeks in advance. Let's check in with local meteorologists, reporting from tornado hotspots. A lot of small tornadoes touch down with no warning. Even to this day in 2020, a small tornado can touch down with no warning at all. We're not that good yet. We don't know a lot about the final steps of a tornado, what happens in the lower levels. Tornadoes can be spawned in a matter of seconds. Radar is important, but it doesn't detect tornadoes. Look, we would be blind without it but the radar beam goes in a straight line and the earth curves. Believe it or not, it actually does curve. And so the radar beam gets higher and higher and higher off the ground. So that beam might be three, four, five thousand 5,000 feet off the ground, but we have no way of knowing what's down at the surface unless somebody's looking at it. See, this is why sometimes witnessing the storm from the ground is your best bet, not the radar. Let's throw it to our human Doppler, Matthew Capucci, who's chasing storms down in Tornado Alley. But this is where the tornado will form any minute. Anytime I'm storm chasing, I try to relay reports to the National Weather Service because the role of storm spotters is vital during severe weather operations. They're the meteorologists, eyes on the ground. All right, guys, large tornado on the ground, north of the coast, good hail falling all around us. Sometimes when you're chasing, the chaser can become the chased when storms actually target you instead of the other way around. That happened to me earlier this year in Bowie, Texas, when a late night EF1 tornado sideswiped my vehicle. So over the years, we've seen an increasing number of tornadoes, but the question is, is that actually a bona fide increase or are we seeing more in the records because more people are actually able to spot them? And that remains the greatest impediment for long-term tornado climate research. So you're gonna have one people seeing tornadoes more. Didn't mean they didn't exist before, just wasn't as populated and people who didn't see them. Two, better technology. So now we're calling more things tornadoes when before they would have just said it was damaging winds. That's easier to study hurricanes. Those are large synoptic scale features that, uh, that are pretty easy to get your hands on and to look at the structure where a tornado might last for five minutes. It might last for two minutes. You know, that's hard to identify any kind of climate signal on one thunderstorm. You just can't do that right now. One of the biggest problems with our inability to predict tornadoes is that it also means we don't know how they're linked to climate change. Our tornado records only go back reliably until the 1950s. So really in the scheme of things, that's not long, especially when it comes to climate, climate being considered three decades or greater. 
What we do know is that tornadoes are happening more often in places where they hadn't before. So we're seeing a shift in what we've considered Tornado Alley. We do know a lot when it's coming to temperature and precipitation. So temperature, you know, the same 30 to 50 years from now, some of the climate that we're seeing in Texas could move all the way up to Oklahoma. And obviously part of the fuel for tornadoes, you have heat, you have humidity, so that may result in more drastic weather events. But a warming climate does not mean there will be an increase in the overall number of tornadoes. The connection is still uncertain. The only observable change is an increase in the number of tornado outbreaks, which are days where multiple tornadoes occur at once. There's some evidence to suggest the number of strong tornadoes may be declining each year, thanks in part to climate change. But the number of tornadoes we've seen the biggest outbreaks is still growing. Just remember though, it only takes one tornado to change your life. So right now we can't tell you much, but check in with me in a couple decades when we have a longer data set and more precise technology from the ground. And maybe then we can talk tornadoes and climate change. Until then, tornadoes will remain the weather event we can least confidently connect to climate change. <laughs>